Support for Nevada Week is provided by Senator William H. Hernstadt, Cashman Equipment, DeCastroverde Law Group, Valley Electric Association, and additional supporting sponsors. Welcome to Nevada Week. Thank you for joining us. I'm Casey Smith. The language, history, and culture of the first people to inhabit Southern Nevada are all in danger of disappearing. The indigenous tribes that once made up the majority of the population in our region are so few in numbers now that many fear their legacy will be lost forever if our education systems don't make a concerted effort to learn about and teach their true history. In conjunction with the PBS series Native America, we've brought together three experts in the field of education to discuss how we can try to preserve and pass on the history and culture of our indigenous peoples here in Southern Nevada. Joining us are Fawn Douglas, an instructor of American Indian Indigenous Studies at UNLV, a co-advisor for the Native American Student Association, and a member of the Las Vegas Paiute Tribe. Sondra Crosgrove, a history professor at the College of Southern Nevada, the president of the League of Women Voters of Nevada, and co-chair of CSN Native American Alliance and Mercedes Krauss, National Education Association of Southern Nevada Native American Caucus Chair, an instructor at Robert Lake Elementary School and member of the Clark County School District's Indian Education Opportunities Parent Committee. Thank you all for joining us, ladies. Thank you very, very much. This is, we're looking Thank forward you. to a very informed discussion. And Fawn, I want to start with you. Let's start with the nomenclature that's respectful and represents that of our indigenous peoples. Okay, is the correct, correct term indigenous, Native American, American Indian? I use all terms interchangeably, but as an indigenous person of this area specifically, I use indigenous because I'm a member of the Las Vegas Paiute tribe and the Southern Paiute people are the indigenous people of this area. And the indigenous people are the original people here before the time of colonization. So I use indigenous, but I've also used Native American and American Indian as well. So none of that would be offensive at all to uh, not to me. Okay, okay. Sandra, can you give us, give us a quick overview of, uh, of the indigenous tribes we have in this region first? So first, I'd like to kind of echo something that Fawn said. Um, when she was talking about words that she uses and how she identifies herself, it's really important when you talk about native peoples that you listen to what they have to say because they will tell you the language they would prefer to hear. Um, when we're talking about the indigenous tribes that are local, even when we say Nevada, that's kind of um, an artificial construct that we're putting on top of them. And so I often say the indigenous peoples of the Great Basin and Colorado uh, Plateau. But local indigenous populations would be the northern and southern Paiutes, uh, the Shoshone, and the Washoe. So a lot of the indigenous peoples here didn't necessarily originate here, they've, they've migrated in or out, is what you're saying? No, what I'm saying is, is they, they are the original people here, but for instance, we have Southern Paiute that are in Nevada and we have Southern Paiute that are in Utah. We just oh, drew a line down between them and separated them into two different political spheres, even though they never considered themselves to be that way. So if I'm gonna be talking about the local Native American population, I'm not going to recognize that artificial line that's separating the, the Southern Paiute peoples. And also when you're looking at uh, school district population of mm -hmm. students, um, our numbers, we have 51 Paiutes that are in our Indian education programming. That includes Las Vegas, Moapa Banda Paiutes, Lovelock Paiutes, and Pyramid Lake. But all of the others in that number of 608 come from other nations. For example, um, I'm an Oglala national and a Santee descendant, and my children are we, what we call urban Indians. And that's, that's kind of what I was getting at. So we want to talk not just about school education, but lifelong learning on this show, okay? As a gauge for how educated we are as a community, as a community in general, what percentage of people that you come across can name even, as you did, all of them, one tribe or group of indigenous peoples here in Nevada? Well, <laughs> it depends on the, the grade, age, people. Uh, but I used to perform at different schools, elementary schools, uh, junior high, high schools for the past 20 plus years here in Las Vegas. And out of all the schools, I'll always ask the question, uh, can somebody name the tribes? And sometimes you'll see people, kids raise their hands and such. Um, and it's very, not so often that they'll say exactly what that tribe is. Maybe they've heard of Paiute. Um, some people will say Navajo because we do have a really large Diné population here in Las Vegas. Um, 
but I, one of the last performances I did was at Bonner Elementary School, and I had all the children's hands going up, and everybody wanted to name them, and they did. Uh, I just chose one, and this mm -hmm. boy, this young boy, just stood up. He said, Shoshone, Washoe, North, uh, Northern Paiute, and Southern Paiute, and I was like, all right, yeah. <laughs> that's, so there are that's good beautiful. Things happening. And that in my classroom also, we, we just had a, a guest and, and my students know that Lakota are the star people and Nuu are the water people. And they were able to say that, but this is an exception. If Not you're, yes. Yeah, I was just gonna chime in and say, so I'm at the community college. So a lot of the students I see are people who are moving here as adults. They're not even aware that there's native peoples in Southern Nevada. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that's, that's amazing. Yeah. That really is amazing given our region. Fawn, we had the opportunity to go to one of your uh, Las Vegas Paiute language learning sessions. It was a wonderful opportunity. We got to talk to a lot of people and we did a lot of listening. Mm -hmm. Can you give us an idea of the need for the broad education, not only in the education system, but of the tribal members themselves? Well, I've only been attending the Paiute language class, and we have it every Thursdays, and it's for our new movie people. Um, it's not only Las Vegas Paiute, but there's Moapa Paiute that attends, Pahrump, and others are allowed to come as well. And me and my, my daughter, we've been attending just the past four plus months or so, and we're just getting into it, and we see that need that we really need to educate ourselves in language. Uh, my grandmother, uh, she would teach me a little bit, some words here and there, but she pressed education and going to school and learning English and focusing on that specifically, and she said that the white man is gonna run over you unless you learn the ways. You have to stay focused on your education. You have to learn everything. You have to learn it for our people. How many people can speak the language fluently? The elders do. Um, I see about five uh, elders that attend the, uh, the Paiute language classes on Thursdays. And it's, um, I'm sorry, but we just had um, uh, services for one of our elders oh, just last right, week. Sure. And uh, that language is going with them. If we don't you know, sit at the table and have these conversations, talk about language and try to make an effort to learn. We are sorry for your loss and it begs the question, how urgent is the situation? How, how, what's the immediate need to pass this all on, the culture, the language, the history? I see an immediate need in my home uh, because I grew up urban. Of course, our tribe is located in the heart of Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're just, just a couple blocks away from Fremont Street. And growing up there, we're still in the city. And my, my daughter, she's grown up not on the reservation, but in the city as well. And she needs to learn uh, her ways, our ways. And I'm still learning those things as well. And like, even though I grew up there, there's a lot that I am still learning. And so we're learning together. And that's the case for all of us. Um, I'm away from my tribal community, but there are a lot of efforts. There's a, a yearly language consortium, Lakota language consortium. We have apps, a lot of technology to help us. But you have to remember that it was a purposeful thing. The, even the small words that we know, we were not supposed to know these at this point. Hmm. So I, I have, it's a two prong thing for me. I, I feel sad sometimes when I think of how little I know, but then I feel very proud when I say the words that I do know because I wasn't even supposed to have these in my mouth at this time. We love that. Now let's use the Southern Paiute as a case study at this point. Why is preserving, for instance, the Paiute language so important to not just the indigenous people, but to all of us? Sandra? Well, language and culture are very interconnected. And I think it's important for everybody to take multiple languages when they go through school, because not only does it, it teach you about somebody else's culture, but it teaches about how their mind works, how they see the world, how they solve problems. And if we're gonna um, expect kids to come out of school and go into the world and be disruptors and innovators, if you're only teaching them one way of thinking and one way of viewing reality, they're never gonna be able to do that. Mm -hmm. And definitely. feel free to add to that. Uh, no, uh, definitely. Um, there is something definitely to be added. Um, we've had the conversation before. I always had kind of an outsider perspective and this helped me see things in a different way. And as you're saying, that adds to the greater community when our students can do this. We have a lot of problems facing our community and our world and we need to be able to look at things differently. And this is definitely one way. Let's skip to tolerance 
And, and I know one of your, your uh, Mercedes, one of your issues is, is the mascot issue. Can you mm -hmm. briefly explain your, your feelings about that? Um, well, I'll tie it back to local culture and knowledge of local culture since we're focusing on that theme. Um, one of the problems is that, you know, the mascot that we have here in our community, it presents a pan-Indian image, which is not representative of Paiute culture or dress or custom and it is harmful for native students but also non-native students they're carrying false knowledge of what this beautiful community looks like and losing out on really understanding the the culture here also uh, it's harmful because it's perpetuating again that pan-indian stereotype um, we have uh, people dressed up uh, one of the best ways that i can relate it is uh, my daughter's dance um, it is a, it's a whole beautiful process of getting the regalia together. Um, one feather, it, I mean, it has, uh, there's a lot to it. Every single part of the regalia, there is something to it. And we have schools or things going on where there are Halloween costumes that are t terrible. They're, they're, embarrassing. Let, let's get into that, okay? okay? How is this history, this culture, this language being taught now in the schools? I mean, mm -hmm. the, and we're talking general population, not amongst, not amongst the elders down through. How much are we teaching? What are we teaching? And what is the scope of what's being taught in the schools today? I can Sandra? I can tell you from elementary okay, school. So we'll um, okay, yeah, let's start, let's start from the there. bottom and okay. go all the way. Right. Um, the two grades that there is somewhat of a focus is fourth grade and seventh grade. But um, I can speak for fourth grade, um, the curriculum that we have. And I have a school where I have an amazing supportive administrator, but the materials that are available to us still only give one side of the picture. And again, if we're only giving one side, we are not presenting. And then at the collegiate level, it's wide open as far as how many sides you can present. Right. right, so when you're in higher ed, you have more freedom. So we don't have lesson plans that are given to us and we don't have as many structures. But unfortunately, uh, the Native American history class I teach is an elective. So if a student self-selects to take the class, and the class always feels it's very popular, mm -hmm. so people are definitely interested, but it's still, it's an elective that sits aside from the regular gen ed curriculum. Mm -hmm. Okay, Senate Bill 107, I'm gonna stick with you, son, for okay. a minute. Passed uh, 2017, the bill requires the establishment, and I'm reading this, of ethnic and diversity content standards, indigenous standards included, and authorizes school boards to provide high school instruction in ethnic and diversity studies to students, indigenous studies included. Mm -hmm. So Sandra, do these, con do these content standards and instructions specifically follow the guidelines you need? And given all of this, is there enough funding for all of this? So there's, there's two things that are going on with Senate Bill uh, 107, because I worked with Tick Sigerbloom on this. Um, I, I think the people who are working on it are doing an amazing job. They're, they're doing exactly what Mercedes has been talking about as far as content and the way it's crafted and presented. The problem is the word authorizes school board. It means it's still an elective. It doesn't mean it's required. It means a school may choose to adopt these. And so I'm, I'm hoping that once it's all presented to the schools that you're going to have amazing administrators and teachers who would be willing to adopt it. But right now it is not required. And that's the thing. It has to be a top down process or else it will just be isolated classrooms and isolated places that the information is being presented. OK. Let's go to solutions. How can we close these gaps that you've all spoken about? Well, at the college level, um, back in 2015, the Native American Student Association at UNLV he held a rally for Indigenous Peoples Day and explaining uh, the history and why it's important to celebrate Indigenous peoples instead of Columbus Day. And a lot of the students that attended, Native and non-Native um, alike, they were talking about it, having these conversations. There was a number of people like, did you know about this? I didn't know about this. And mind you, these are freshmen coming in from our K through 12 system sure. here in mm -hmm. Clark County. Mm -hmm. And they're having this conversation. It's like, nobody taught, taught us this. I didn't know anything about this. They were really upset mm -hmm. that they're coming to college and not having the basic information or hearing the 
truth about the history of uh, Christopher Columbus. Yeah. And it, it begs the question, too, in this day and age, a lot of the young people do want to know more. They yes. do. It's not yes. just cookie-cutter yes. education mm -hmm. anymore. Yes. And do you find that in, in the... The grades you teach? Um, definitely, but again, there is specific curriculum that is presented, and we have some limitations, just like there are in higher ed. Um, but there are materials available. Um, this I have, it's put together by N N Nevada educators, native Nevada educators. We have culture trunks available through our school district that talk about di all different tribes. There is information available, but again, we need it not to be an isolated Thing. Another problem is, um, you know, you're saying this that has passed. There is more of a focus on multicultural rather than specific, um, you know, indigenous cultures. Mm -hmm. So that needs to be brought out more specifically Sandra, or else about, it's oh, passed I'm sorry, over. Sandra, right. what about embedding in, in classes? I think, um, and I'm going to kind of go off with off of Mercedes right now, is I think we need to do baby steps right now because as, as Fawn said, Students are coming to college and not even knowing who Columbus really is. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's going to have to be a certain period of time where we literally set aside time to get everybody up to speed on the things that they have not been taught for generations. Yes. But then ultimately, it's going to just have to be embedded into the curriculum, mm -hmm. that there's not just one way of looking at things. There needs to be the full picture and the full story, even if part of that story is not nice. It's maybe something bad that happened. And it might be presented one way at the elementary school level, maybe another way at the high school level. But then by the time they get to Fawn and I, at least they should be aware of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Exactly. And it should be a, a requirement at the college level that yes. everybody takes the race, class, and gender yes. class. And, everybody. And it is so important that we have it embedded. But, you know, we are not even crawling yet. The embedded part is when we're at a full stride, we do need to start, in my opinion, with the step of having uh, a committee for a Native American History Month where we are having at least something, the announcements, talking about uh, important figures and events in our history, uh, having community events for our, our, our schools. Um, that is very important. Also, we have something called the Johnson O'Malley Modernization Act when we're talking about funding. Um, we are currently only funded at the number of students that we had in 1995. I know we were talking about it earlier, what a boom we've had in our city since 1995. But we need to support this uh, Johnson O'Malley Modernization Act because if we don't, that is the only funding that we will get no matter what our population is. And speaking of the Johnson O'Malley Act, uh, going back to tribal education itself, mm -hmm. um, how is the history and the culture, Fawn, I'll ask you first, the history, culture, and the language specifically, how is that being taught now within well, the tribe? Well, it should be taught in the home. And if it's not taught in the home, uh, we, have to, we have to seek it out. I have to take my daughter to the, the Paiute elders class on Thursdays or sit with some family members or attend ceremonies and such. And earlier we were talking about language and how important it is. Well, when we have our ceremonies, when somebody passes away or when there's a memorial, these songs are sung in Paiute. Um, every song has meaning from sunset to sunrise. And if you don't know the words of that song, I mean, they're just, it's just a, a tone, it's a sound, it's a song. I mean, I know that these, they have meaning that they're to get the spirit to you know, their next step. I know that and we know that in our hearts. But to know the language and the words, um, there's, there's a missing link there. How much of this is written down? Um, there are there are some books. I've read some books about some of the elders telling stories, and there are some written texts, but but not much. Um, yeah, and there isn't much that people want to put out there publicly. Um, there are some parts of the culture that are just for the culture and not to be taken by others. Mm -hmm. And so there's a respect line too, but we got to find out what what hurdle we need to get past to, to learn. Mercedes, what about on the reservations and, and, and uh, in the community, in the schools, public schools? How is that passed on? Um, again, it basically, it's just at an individual uh, level based on the educators that are m making up the individual schools. So we, the, t the teachers need to learn to teach what, what needs to be taught. Is that mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. And it needs to, again, I keep saying top down because we have so many constraints. We have so many, 
you know, curriculum standards and new curriculum, things that we have the pressure from, um, if that is not something that's given importance. I, I liken it to, I was in Wisconsin where we had uh, Act 31, where it was an actual act where it was part of licensing, part of education that they receive information on the local tribes there. And uh, we need to have something top down in order for it to really happen in a way that we're talking about. Sandra, if, oh. Oh, and the ahead, information is there. I don't know if you're able to see the front of this, but here is all the information about the Nevada tribes. Okay. Everything, Nevada I mean, if the Indian. teachers, the educators wanted to see anything, here is a book. The work is there. Mm -hmm. The information is there for other uh, youth to learn about this K through 12. Great reference, thank you. Okay. Sandra, if the majority of indigenous students are from tribes outside of the state, like Navajo, we mentioned. Mm -hmm. How does this affect what's being taught? Does it compromise the teachings, for example, of the, of the Paiutes? I don't think so, um, because there's, you can specifically talk about your local indigenous communities, yes. but then there's, there's things that apply to all indigenous peoples mm -hmm. when you're talking about colonization, when you're talking about, um, I mean, it's important to understand that for a long period of time, it was American government policy to take indigenous children away from their families, send them to boarding school, punish them if they spoke their language, separate them out of the family so they could not learn their history, mm -hmm. keep them long enough that there's a, the breakdown in family ties, mm -hmm. that there's a lot of trauma that's associated with language and history and culture mm -hmm. that we're now trying to kind of he to do healing so that people can feel comfortable talking about these things. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, there's all of the constraints that Mercedes has been mentioning within the schools. And so I think it's, it's important for anybody that wants to really help and be a good ally mm -hmm. to understand that, that any type of help is going to be useful. Listen to what the community is asking you for. Um, you know, talk about specifics or you can just talk about in general. Mm -hmm. But just make sure that you're helping and that you're trying to achieve some type of solution. Yeah. So what type of coordination, if you will, around the table here mm -hmm. with, with what you all represent, do we need to make things work better? Well, one thing I did want to say, I mean, we want to know, I am I'm native, but this is not my home. I want to know, my family wants to know about our host community. That's very important. We need to know that also. Um, and your question was... Uh, how do we how do we do that? How, how do how do we make that happen um, through to school through coordination of, of of who and when? Well, I mean this this is why we know each other. Mm -hmm. So if I'm going to teach Native American history at, offered at CSN, mm -hmm. then I need to be a really good listener. I need to know Fawn. I need to know Mercedes. I need to know their community. I need to be very aware of what they're asking for, um, and just be reflective of what I'm hearing from them. And, uh, you know, there's a big push to have our students college ready. Mm -hmm. Well, it's very apparent that, you know, in this area, our students are not college ready. So I think that would be a good uh, starting point, you know, to motivate our, our school district and our educators to start uh, teaching this information more. Looking at where we've started, which was a long time ago, and, and the history, as you, as you said, that's, that's written is not necessarily, it's one-sided history in, in a lot of aspects. How far have we come in 2018? Are we making strides that are measurable? I don't feel so. Well, I'm, I'm seeing some progress at UNLV. Yeah. I mean, compared from 2015 to where we are now, we finally have a minor in American Indian Indigenous Studies, which is great. Uh, our student base has, has jumped. Um, there used to be a time when we'd look at the scholarship for American Indian Alliance and there'd be maybe two, five, seven people apply who are Native American for this scholarship. And last year we were reviewing 40, 45 applications from our Native American student base there. We have 700 uh, students that are Native American or have registered as that, but 80 of them are uh, enrolled in a tribe or descendant from a tribe, which means their mother, father, or grandparent is from an enrolled member of a tribe. Mm -hmm. And again, we do have materials available. As I said, even the school district has culture trunks available, mm -hmm. but there has to be some effort to put together readily accessible curriculum that is shared and uh, you know, a place for teachers to come to get information, accurate information. Yes. It, it's out there. Uh, now. The, the College of Southern Nevada is one of the few community colleges that offers Native American history as a, an elective. It tends to be more kind of this multicultural, mm -hmm. more vague. 
Um, and it was about 15 years ago, it was one of my colleagues who had to fight to get it into our general uh, education curriculum. How can we make that curriculum um, go down into the, the public school curriculum? What I would personally like to see is I would like to see the chancellor of the Nevada System of Higher Education meet with the superintendents of the school districts and provide time and space so that those of us who teach in higher ed can sit down with the teachers who are in K-12 mm -hmm. and just talk because I think sometimes teachers feel overwhelmed. This is just one more thing. How am I going to fit it in? I've already got so much to do. And as Mercedes says, it's, it's there. We have pedagogical ways that you can talk about it, embed it. It's and that not takes extra. a lot of time, and time is not something that we have on our side right now. We're going to have to end it here, but thank you very much, and we'd like to invite you back in a year to see how much progress has been made. Thank We'd you. like to thank our guests, Fawn Douglas, instructor of American Indian Indigenous Studies at UNLV, Sonda Cosgrove, a history professor at CSN, and Mercedes Krauss, instructor at Robert Lake Elementary School and member of CCSD's Indian Education Opportunities Parent Committee. Now, if you'd like to learn more about any of the topics discussed here on Nevada Week, or if you have a topic or question you'd like us to explore, visit our website, find us on social media, or email the show. That's it for this edition of Nevada Week. I'm Casey Smith. Thank you for spending part of your Nevada Week with Vegas PBS. See you next time.